if I was someone facing a child support arrears, foreclosure, back taxes that I may owe or they say that I owe, spousal support, um, even a traffic violation or some type of infraction. And they are trying to pillage my trust to take money and that money is going to be used for the various agencies within the state. I'm going to share some information with you that I think everybody should know. You can use this to create or present an argument the next time you are in court. Start with this question. What is the jurisdiction of this court and how do you have jurisdiction over me, which I am in an express trust? Express trust can only be heard in courts of equity, which is backed by the common law, declaration or bill of rights of the Constitution. That is a question that you will ask the court. You would do it verbally and also in writing. How I do it in writing is by instituting three documents in every case. An affidavit of denial. You must deny the complaint that is against you, even if it is a traffic violation that you disagree with. Deny everything point for point, word for word, line by line. That's according to Rule 8. If you don't deny the complaint, then the court will continue to move on and presume that everything that is said in that complaint to be correct. You never denied it. The second thing that I put in is a motion to intervene for injunction, right? The third thing that I would put in is a motion for discovery. You need to ask for discovery. Nothing is going to move forward until they prove that they have that jurisdiction over your trust property. Now, I can guarantee you None of us has been inside of a common law court. In all actuality, they are operating under what's called the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946. Let's take a look at that. Go down to the bottom. It says pieces of United States administrative law serves as a sort of constitution, a sort of constitution. This is a trial like procedure. It is not based upon the real common law constitution in the state which they have you. They have you inside of neglect and abuse courts, which is unconstitutional. All right. Step four, go to EIN online via IRS again and obtain your venture or trust enterprise EIN as an irrevocable trust. Note, this trust will also need to be classified as a subcategory known as a GRAT. G-R-A-T, Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. All right, that's because you want to have an account that's readily available to accept funds from whole life insurance policies, term life, it doesn't matter which life insurance, um, estate inheritance, real estate transactions, all of the above. That type of account is ready for high yields with dividends as well, right? So this is required so that you may open a domestic bank account within the United States. Note, here's another note, very important. The Foreign Express Trust 98 number, it cannot do banking in the United States, not to be confused with doing business in the United States, but it cannot do banking. So therefore, you will need a fiduciary agent to accept its funds. And this is one of the methods used to keep the foreign sole trustee away from touching your assets or funds. Use a trust enterprise to do that. The trust enterprise EIN will have a six or seven after the dash. In every EIN, it is number, number, dash, followed by 
seven other numbers. When you have a six or seven after the dash confirming you have an EIN under the laws of TEFRA, which stands for Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act. This protects your account from tax reporting for transactions over 10,000 and most importantly, account closure or seizure of funds. Uh, you, you've seen that happen plenty of times when it comes to regular personal accounts or business accounts. This type of account with this type of EIN attached to it prevents all of that. All right, so let's go to step five. Banks the money love you. Back to the Your own money. Loan, and also, charge you when interest. The bank never came up with any of its own money to obtain the promissory note. Am I hearing this right? I give you the equivalent of $200,000. You return the funds back to me, and I have to repay you $200,000 plus interest. Do you think I'm stupid? All the banks are doing this. Congress allows this. Does Congress allow the banks to breach written agreements, use false and misleading advertising, act without written permission, authorization, and without the alleged borrower's knowledge to transfer actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the bank and then return it back as a loan? But the borrower got a check in the house. Is it true the actual cash value that was used to fund the bank loan check came directly from the borrower and that the bank received the funds from the alleged borrower for free. This is true. Is it the bank's policy to transfer actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the bank and then keep the funds as the bank's property, which they then loan out as bank loans as if they actually owned it and loaned their own money? Yes. Was it the bank's intent to receive actual cash value from the borrower and return the value of the funds back to the borrower as a loan? Yes. Do you believe that it was the borrower's intent to fund his own bank loan check? I was not there at the time and I cannot know what went through the borrower's mind. So if a lender loaned a borrower $10,000 and the borrower refused to repay the money, do you believe the lender is damaged? If a loan is not repaid, the lender is damaged. So is it the bank policy to take actual cash value from the borrower use it to fund the bank loan check and never return the actual cash value to the borrower. The bank returns the funds. Was the actual cash value the bank received from the alleged borrower returned as a return of the money the bank took or was it returned as a bank loan to the borrower? As a loan. So how did the bank get the borrower's money for free? That's how it works. No more questions, Your Honor. This is for entertain purposes only. Um, I talked to the GM about this uh, MCO title, right? So if you see here, it's a distributor deal assignment number one, right? But in reality, the dealership did not sign this. What they do is they put your name as the dealer. Put your name as the dealer. The only thing they sign back in the form is their dealer license number and where the MCO come from. Here is where either the credit union or even the bank information goes here. Again, who 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 has the MCO is the lien holder. Again, who who has the MCO is the lien holder. So and I will show proof. And again, this is for entertainment purpose only. So if you see here, and it be 
you also can see this comes from the uh, credit union, right? So it tells you here they were unable to verify the lien because guess what? They don't have one because they never received the MCO, right? So the form right here will also tell you how the MCO is filled out, right? So you see here, the dealer will write their name as the dealership license. See that? See that? But the lien cannot be entered if they never receive they never receive the MCO. Right? Furthermore, it tells you right here the certificate of title is not a title. You see that? The license plates prove that the government owns your car once the DMV uh, receive the MCO from the finance company. Okay? But the finance company cannot send this in if, again, they don't have this form, the MCO. And this is one of the titles when you pay off a vehicle. This is the title that they send you. It's this one. Can y'all tell the difference from the color, right? One green, one is gold. The gold one is the actual official title to the cars. Do y'all research. It's how you get free cars. Do not scroll past this, okay? I'm about to read you something that is really about to rock your world, okay? This is from the works of Dr. Laila Africa. So join along. Medical laboratory norms, daily recommended allowances of vitamins and minerals, therapeutic dosages of herbs and drugs, baby formulas, disease reactions, human growth and development schedules, brain activity and psychology are all based upon the melanin content of Caucasians. The laboratory and scientific norms have to be different for each race because each race is biochemically different. The laboratory standards test black people as if they are white, then declare black people sick because blacks do not meet white standard. This is medical white racism. When you consider the skincare industry, this theory applies to this as well. The skincare industry is based on Eurocentric standards, Western education and Western standards. And when you consider ourselves as black people, skin types, four, five, and six, more so skin types five and six, we are pretty much taught a lot of skincare routines based on Eurocentric standards. I deal with clients that come into my business all the time during consultation and they're giving me products that they're using that are terrible for their skin, but some non-black skincare professional told them to use it. And even down to the literature and the education that they present to you, whether you're in esthetician school or in some form of medical school, it lacks any type of representation. It lacks any type of understanding and real in-depth study of melanin. And in my perspective, I believe melanin should be a subject that should be taught just like A and P. It should be melanin one and two should be a requirement for anyone going into the medical field or the aesthetics field. So when it comes to our skin, you have to be extremely knowledgeable and you have to have precaution. And the funny thing is, a lot of times that knowledge does not come with your degree. It does not come with your certification. It does not come with that license. I've learned that being in this field, the best knowledge is hands-on and self-knowledge, like this type of stuff right here. So I just say that to say that guys, we are different. What works for them may not work for you. What works for you may not work for them. They love to make skincare very much kumbaya because we are the $13 trillion spending market. So if we make something, we gotta make sure that it's definitely promoted to the blacks. But that's where I'm here, to pioneer this world and pioneer to this field and bring y'all truth. You are not the name.
The name is your intellectual property. The name is a gift given to you at birth. It is your birthright. It is how your trust is created. Once you have the trust in hand and you have reached the age of majority, you will then be entitled to full faith and credit. Upon studying, showing yourself approved, you will then take your intellectual property and place it in a trust with a declaration and a certificate. And it too shall be given full faith and credit. Because you're not the name, you must choose one for yourself. You don't own it, you control it. So you get a power of attorney, common law copyright, security agreement, a fee schedule, and a DBA. Because your status has changed and your name has changed, you must take over as authorized representative of the name and update it by updating your social security, I mean, excuse me, your passport and getting five stars. Then you fund the trust. Without a funded trust, it does not exist. You become sovereign, making you a nation. The DMV has the same power as you once you apply for a DOT number. That makes you private, non-commercial. There's no liability because you are a nation. You have a trust account funded by the account the state created for you. And the name has given power of attorney to the flesh. There's a security agreement and a fee schedule in place. The DBA lets them know that's how you move in. And if they decide to violate your common law copyright, they can assess fees. You must be aware of the hierarchy of laws. The United States is bankrupt. Claim your property and lien it. You have the right to. The all caps name is the debtor. You are the secured party. You must become the authorized representative for the name. You must, and you need to know that black or African-American is a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. And is everything in the law. This is everything in the law. And yet, you, didn't, you weren't even taught there was different statuses. Why do you think it was so hard to arrest Hillary Clinton? Because she's a state national. President Trump's been a state national since 2008. Bible and our treaties, and then we have everything else. Now, if these are corporate bylaws, and the Supreme Court says since rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law, they're corporate bylaws, and they're for employees of the corporation to follow, how come you guys are following them? Oh, no, no, no. You're required to follow them. You know why? Because you gave up your rights. See, I've handled some pretty big federal cases, like the Malheur trials and the Bundy trials. Jeez, it's really funny how all the people with attorneys who took a plea deal went to jail in those trials, but the ones that I made a state national caused the cases to be dismissed and everyone went home. Okay. The reason I say that is because everything in this world is about status, standing, and jurisdiction. Status. What does the United States government in Title VIII, Section 1101 define statuses? Because there's more than one. And yet they make you believe that you're just supposed to be one of those statuses, a U.S. citizen, right? Oops, man, I can't write where the darn.
My brain's thinking ahead of my pen. <laughs> U.S. citizen. Let's think about that for just a minute. What does the word citizen mean? City is municipal. Zen is servant. A municipal servant, a public servant. Oh, geez, now you're an employee of government. <laughs> Through your own self-determination and proclamation and check in a box that you were a U.S. citizen. You just made yourself subject to all these corporate bylaws. See, me, I'm a Californian. I'm an Oregonian. I'm a state national. I have limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. And I am king of my land. I'm the king. I don't have to obey those rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances. Now, I'm going to be safe because I love my neighbor and I want to do no harm. So I'm going to be safe. But if I'm going down the freeway and the traffic's light, the weather's good, the roads aren't slick, it's a straight line, and I'm doing 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over, maybe I'm doubling it to see if I can, and I feel safe doing that, is there a problem with that? None whatsoever. Did I harm another soul? No harm. No harm, no crime. Okay? So I challenge that occasionally. I like to go fast. Status standing jurisdiction. I usually do it when I rent a car. Put full coverage on it. No, I'm kidding. Standing has to be earned. Standing has to be earned. See, have you ever heard the thing, little statement that says, all persons are equal in the law, rich or poor, black or white. doesn't matter. You're all equal. That's a true statement. It's because you're all dead. You're all dead. See, the next word here is person. Person. So look at what that word means. What's the root of person? It's purser. P-U-R-S-E-R -E is the root. This. This. Need to know about this. And this, you should have one of these, one of these, and one of these. Before you do this, you become an American national, not a state national. I see a lot of people posting up, they got their birth certificate authenticated and they're calling themselves state nationals. You are American. The state does not exist. The state exists through this. No, the state exists through this. This is what created the state. So now once you understand this, universal laws deal with energies. Natural laws deal with the natural ways of all objects and beings which manifested in this dimension. You're in a dimension. Laws of maxims are God's laws. They're straight out of the Bible and they are rights. They cannot be taken away. Okay? That makes you a sovereign being, a divine being. You can claim to be human if you choose to. It's yourself. You're the master of it. You have the ability to create laws and constitutions for yourself and any corporations. This is a corporation any corporation. So if you're going to make a corporate, if you're going to make a treaty or, or a contract for that corporation, okay, that would include, the laws you include would be your power of attorney, your fee schedule, your um, injunctions, etc. Which, which is how you begin to correct the position. Because this is your bookkeeper. You've only created debt. Now you must correct the position and do the other side of the ledger. In order to free yourself, you must know the laws of maxim, which is God's laws. And the 10 maxims of commercial law, a workman is worthy of his hire. All are equal under the law. In commerce, truth is sovereign. So in, if truth is sovereign, you are the truth. Truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. 
An unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. An unrebutted affidavit becomes judgment in commerce. A matter must be expressed to be resolved. He who leaves the field of battle first loses by default. Sacrifice is the measure of credibility. A lien or claim cannot be can be satisfied. book and that is so pointy and here's the case I won against Harris County Harris County I always take my name out because I'm not going to give my name until you can give me uh, what's called and police always call it it's RAS what's your RAS and they automatically assume I'm a cop because I'm using their lingo and what RAS stands for reasonable articulable suspicion that I've committed a crime. Okay, you don't have that? Okay, what's your SAF? Single articulable fact. Well, you don't have that either? Okay, you, you, you've you just basically said that there's no reason to pull me over because you haven't seen a crime. Okay, here's the case I won against Harris County. You can see the stamps and date. And uh, they ended up buying me a, a, a brand new Porsche 911 turbo all-wheel drive convertible uh, with them pulling me over and let me spend a night in jail. So and here's the lawsuit, and uh, I've got these for everybody to see. And you can see that it's all put together. And there it is, signed by the DA and stamped, showing they lost the case. And they lost it, and you they paid and you. And I, I sued them. And what did you win? $250,000 for a night in jail. And then Supreme Court says no license necessary to drive an automobile on public highways. Now these these are all documented. So what this is called is called stare decisis. Okay, we're running a case that's already been won in the Supreme Court, and they are in violation of their oath of office when they don't pay attention. My license plate doesn't give you. If you look at my license plate, the license plate alone says I'm not in commerce. Now, if I have a license plate like this car over here and that car over there, they all have license plates. License plates mean I'm engaged in commerce. I'm not engaged in commerce. This doesn't give them the authority to pull me over because they see that. What do you, where do you see that I'm engaged in commerce? What gave you that uh, suspicion that I'm engaged in commerce? You have the right to travel freely unencumbered. And that's all in the law. And when we look at the law books, Supreme Court has already ruled on this. And you go back to what is a license. And I want people to do their own homework. Go read the case of Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. Or read the case of, uh, what is it, uh, Shuttlesworth versus uh, the city of Birmingham, Alabama. These are showing that you don't need a license. A license is to do something that is immoral, that's sanctioned by the government like a 007 license to kill, okay? That's immoral. They need to be licensed by the state. In other words, they're protected by the state on that. There's nothing immoral about leaving my house to go get a gallon of milk. I only need a license if I'm using the public property. The roadways are public, and they're paid for by the gas tax, okay? They're not paid for by traffic violations. So when you get into the law, this is what scares most cops, and I'm going to get to it here if I, the wind would stop for one second. This is what most cops don't like, because they don't know it. It's non-emergency use of emergency vehicle lights and sirens is a felony. Pulling me over for a traffic violation, they just committed a felony. And if they don't have reasonable suspicion that I'm engaged in commerce, they're done. And I'll bring out my brother's, I'm gonna put this away real quick. I'm gonna bring State out. Trooper. This was his book that he had in his car. Okay. Texas Criminal and Criminal Manual. I went to his car and I made him read this. And you're gonna love this. This is out of their own law books. This is the Lexus Nexus. And it says under section 502.003, Registration by political subdivision prohibited, except as provided by subsection B. A political subdivision, a political subdivision of this state may not re, not require an owner of a motor vehicle to 
register the vehicle, pay a motorcycle motor vehicle registration fee, or pay occupational tax or license fee in the connection with the motor vehicle. This section does not affect the authority of a municipality to, right here, license and regulate the use of a motor vehicle for compensation. So if I'm not engaged in conversation, compensation being paid to go from point A to point B, I don't need a driver's license. I don't, don't need to register my automobile. Well, and it is an automobile. Massachusetts? All traffic codes are pretty similar because they're all federal. They're pretty much the is same. Is that a copy of Massachusetts? Yeah. It's going, you can online? Find, you can find it. And I will tell you, you go to um, uh, like Amazon or eBay and buy a used one. My brother had to pay $300 for this book. Okay. <clears throat> and then you look at it here. Imposed a permit fee or street rental charge for the operation of each motor vehicle. Okay. Used to transport passengers for compensation. So who needs a driver's license? A taxi driver? You anybody that's anybody anybody that's engaged in making money using the public property. Benjamin Franklin said nothing is certain except death and taxes. This is what he meant. Go to the IRS website and pull up publication 6209. I'm going to show you how you're dead in the eyes of taxes and go to section four, which is document locator number. And what you're looking for is code five. Code five is information return processing estate and gift tax. Then you're gonna go back to this section and you're gonna click on section two, which is tax returns and forms. Now, when you get a job, your employer wants you to fill out a what? A W-4. That is called an employee withholding certificate. Look at that tax class, five. Look at your W-2, your wage and tax statements, class five. Social Security Benefit Statement, Class 5. All your 1099s, A through S, Class 5. Class 5 is Information Return Processing for Estate and Gift Taxes. Go to the Internal Revenue Manual. Look up Section 21.7.13.3.2.2, Subsection 2. And it says... An infant is the decedent of an estate or grantor, owner, or trustor of trust, guardianship, receivership, custodianship that has yet to receive their social security number. So when you fill out this W-4 form, you're filling out this withholding certificate for your estate. When you get this W-2 form back so you can file your 1040s, this W-2 statement is for the wages and taxes for your estate. And for those who don't know what a decedent is, a decedent is a legal term used to refer to a deceased person, meaning you are dead. And again, if we look right back at the Internal Revenue Manual, it says an infant is the decedent of an estate. And again, these are estate tax forms. If I'm not mistaken, on the 1040, you get a 12,500 exclusion on your income. But if you filed estate tax returns, there's three million and some change for exclusion on the estate side, and one million and some change for exclusion on the gift side. Read, people, read. And if people were wondering about the master file that the IRS supposedly has, it's called the debtor master file. It does exist, and here are the master file codes that you can go through so you can find out what specific information that you want to request. If you got something on your credit report and you really want to get it removed by disputing it, you might really want to listen to this. So here's a mistake that I see a lot of people make when using consumer law. Pay attention to this. When disputing certain accounts, you have to know what law verbiage to use for each person because you can use the wrong law verbiage and get marked as a frivolous account. This is how you address debt collectors, banks, and credit report agencies. Regardless of what section you're at, your claim and your argument is that you're always the consumer. You're not the creditor. You're not original creditor. And banks, dealerships, and credit report agencies are not debt collectors. All banks and dealerships fall under the Truth in Lending and the FCRA. Therefore, you should never use the FDCPA to identify banks and dealerships at all. The FDCPA is mainly for third-party corporations such as debt collectors. For example, if you're addressing the CRA, a credit reporting agency, you want to be using the FCRA. This would be for people like... Experian, TransUnion, 
Ecofax. You want to define yourself as a consumer under 15 U.S.C. 1681 A.C. Now, this go for banks and dealerships, as far as cars and stuff. If any time you coming after them, you always want to address yourself as a consumer under 15 U.S.C. 1602 I. Three, this one is very important because this is where everybody make mistakes at. Debt collectors. If you're ever going after a debt collector, you always want to address them with the FDCPA laws and define yourself as a consumer under 15 U.S.C. 1692A3. The term consumer means any natural person obligated or alleged obligated to pay the debt. And they give you a choice there. Which one are you? Obligated or alleged obligated? So as you can see, the credit reporting agencies, banks, and debt collectors, you're always defined as the consumer and not the original creditor. So you always wanna make sure that you send the correct law verbiage to the right person because you cannot send FDCPA laws to banks or dealerships. They will look at you like you crazy and your remedy will be dishonored. And you also can be marked as a frivolous account, so be careful. That, that's not hypothetical or conjectural, it's concrete and evident. I can prove it that that's what right. In fact, if you go to the PIPCO bond website, it tells you right on the, you know who PIPCO bond is, bonds are? Mm -hmm. I doubt if anybody even knows who PIPCO is. I've been to their website. Okay, that's the U.S. arm of Allianz SE out of Munich, Germany. And it says right on their website that they forward your mortgage payments as cash flow claims to investors. So you're not making payments on a mortgage, you're making payments on, on an investment contract. And if you read your deed of trust, it has a third 30 year maturity. It says that on the note. If you go to 15 USC 78 CA 10, it says any note, all notes are securities except those with a maturity of nine months or less. That's the exclusion rule. So the only securities that are notes are notes with a maturity of nine months or less. All notes have a maturity of 30 years or more. I've seen them as low as 12 months. Then it goes to 15, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. But they're all securities, they're not notes. And all securities are governed by Article 8, not Article 3. There, and it says that in 4-102 under applicability. It says that if it's an item that's includable in Article 3 and it's governed by 8, 8 controls 3 and 4. If there's a conflict, 8 controls 3 and 4. Article 4 does uh, deals with transfers and deposits in banks. Article 3 deals with negotiable instruments. But you're not dealing with a negotiable instrument. A security is a non-negotiable instrument. It's a financial asset. Go read 8-102, subsection 5. Financial assets, not a negotiable instrument. So you're giving them a security and they sell it to investors. Then they forward your cash flow claims to the investors. That's Have you done not, this yourself? Well, yeah, I, I, I went into court, argued this in a court room, and uh, we were doing a telephonic, uh, this is on a mortgage foreclosure case. I was in the courtroom live talking to the judge face to face about this. I was arguing, I was saying this very thing that I'm saying now to the court. And the attorney was on the phone. This is a woman. Did anyone know that you can file civil rights complaints with the Internal Revenue Service? Let me say that again for people who don't understand what I just said. You can file civil rights complaints with the Internal Revenue Service. The reason why this is so important is because everything that everybody is doing has to do with taxes. Because the Internal Revenue Service is pretty much the glorified accounting firm for the Department of Treasury. And then somebody's probably going to ask me, well, why would I file this form instead of going to the courthouse? Well, the courthouse is going to make you pay a fee. You can file this complaint with the IRS for free. 
I don't think people understand because there is no money, everybody is in an insolvency proceeding. Insolvent means you're broke or civilly dead. And civil rights have to do with corporate rights. There goes your 14th and 16th amendment. Everybody has a tax liability even if you're exempt. All right, this is part two. This is part two. So don't take my word for it. Get your pen and paper. Write down what I'm saying. Google it and verify. Now pay attention. What they are required to have. This is, this is one of the closest ones that I can find, but is still invalid. And I'm going to tell you why. Who is Vic Regalado? Is his name Vic Regalado? Is it Victor Regalado? Is there a middle name? It has to be your full person Okay, because they are operating in what's called personum. All right, so your personum is your birth, bill of lading, the registration. All right, the same name on your social security number if that's what you are operating under. All right, is it Vic? Is it Victor? Is it Victor Alejandro Regalado? I mean, what is it? It's not Vic Regalado, I can tell you that. So that's a false impersonation, and that is treason. All right. Now, he is the Tulsa County Sheriff. All right. Now, as an employee of what? Of what? The judicial court. Because you are operating under a corporate structure. And I've already shown that Duns and Bradstreet, the judicial courts of Oklahoma. Guys, do a Duns and Bradstreet search on this. Judicial courts of Oklahoma. If uh, you do a Duns and Bradstreet, you'll find Tulsa County Sheriff's, and Tulsa County also has a Duns and Bradstreet as a corporation. Now, here's another thing. If you notice, the notary did not put their commission number on there. They did not put any of those numbers on there that they, they need to have properly. Where's the expiration date? All right. Now, the county court clerk, Don Newberry, I have on video record him admitting he does not have his Constitution oath of office. He actually has a false swearing pursuant to Section 2, and I will read that in Part 3 and describe how, are they, how they are violating this um, by dealing with anything of value. So, Don Newberry, court clerk, stamping any kind of indebtenture or debt as the states and territories uh, incur all debt debts. So Don Newberry, the county court clerk for Tulsa County, does not have his oath of office, making this null and void. All right. Michael Willis does not have his oath of office, making this null and void. And who is it? An affiant signature or the sheriff's signature? Which one is it? Is he a sheriff or an affiant? We have to comprehend and understand the Germanic Wiccan English language that is laid before us, people. There's no coincidence that they compel your entity by summons to their religious dis justicia courts. On a brass plaque somewhere in an obscure location inside the hospital, probably under a stairwell, it says this hospital is a foundling hospital. Found lean hospital. So a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. She goes through a major medical procedure called childbirth where she's in pain and under duress. She's probably under the influence of painkillers of some type. You gotta be pretty tough to give birth. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> anyway, she has that beautiful baby and all she's thinking about is getting home with it and leave it. But see the baby in history, throughout history, came out of the water, was tugged through the birth canal, was docked at the dock by the dock tender where a bill of lading was filled out and received on the cargo, where its soul was taken, its soul plates, the footprints of the baby. The placenta was taken, okay? They took the baby's soul and they sent it out with a tug and it's presumed dead and lost at sea until it should return and claim its minor estate. 
No physician delivers a baby. Only a doctor does. Doctor is doc tender. The baby is a vessel, a ship. That's where the all caps name comes in. If you look at the names of ships, they're in all capital letters. Okay. No one disclosed the terms and conditions of the contract, yet you were handed a stack of papers to fill out and you were only told, and this was right out of the nurse's manual, this is just to register your baby with the state and to give it a name. And you fill out the paperwork and you name your baby and you sign as an informant. What is the legal definition of the word informant? Someone who gives someone else up to another, thereby giving the title and equity of your child to the state. This creates a doctrine called parents patre. So she'd write that. It's Latin for state is your parent. State is the parent. Creates a doctrine of parents patre. Through this doctrine, that's how they have control over you and through your consent of being a citizen, a person, a resident. Three things you never want to be.